Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on biosamples, supporting multi-omics data integration with fair sample records. My name is Melissa Burke. I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer, and I will be your host for this webinar. This webinar is part of a series in which we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools that are available for the life sciences community. Each month we hear from local and international experts who present on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australian researchers to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events by following us on social media or subscribing to our newsletter. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, I am joining you from Mianjin on the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us live today, and I have a few things to share with you to help you get the most out of the webinar. Firstly, the webinar is being recorded and you'll soon find that on our YouTube channel, along with recordings of previous webinars. Auto-generated captions are available and you can turn these on or off using the options in your Zoom dashboard. Also in your Zoom dashboard, you'll see the Q&A box. This is where you can write questions, which we'll save to the end of the webinar, where we'll do our best to answer them for you. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Tony Burdett from Envil EBI to speak to us about biosamples. Tony leads the archival infrastructure and technology team at Envil EBI, which develops services and provides technology to support the activities of their molecular archives, including data submission, storage, validation, coordination, and presentation. Envil EBI is near Cambridge in the UK, and Tony has very kindly gotten up very early in the morning to join us for this webinar. So welcome to the webinar, Tony, and thank you for joining us so early. I'll now hand it over to you to start your presentation. Okay, great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, let me share my screen briefly. Hey, great. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, <clears throat> really happy to be talking about biosamples. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to, to what biosamples actually is and, and, and a few of the basic concepts about, um, about how we think about data integration in a multi-omic sense and, and, and a, a little bit about what we, how we consider Fair, fair data principles. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so yeah, my name is Tony Bidder. As Melissa mentioned, I run the archival infrastructure and technology team at, at EBI. Um, we've got a team of about 20 people. Um, that, that I am also the head, as well as being the head of this biosamples database, I'm also the joint head of ENA along with, with Guy Cochran. I'm not going to talk about that today. It, it is a little bit relevant to, to the topic. Um, and if, if you're interested in, in more about ENA, we can, we can talk about that in some of the questions. A little bit more background. Thank you, Melissa, for the great intro. Um, sort of in in general, I uh, my background is biological, medical. I'm mostly a sort of service engineering and bioinformatics person, and my career has been heavily focused around building biological databases and actually in 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 fair data management. Um, I've built built and helped develop or run development teams for a number of different databases in my time at EBI. That includes things like Array Express, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, has been been sort of folded. The Array Express is now a data collection rather than a dedicated database. The Expression Atlas, the Biosamples database. I've also done some work in ontology tooling and things to support data integration in a much fairer sense, as well as we've spent some time working on the GWAS catalog. And I also jointly run the human cell atlas data coordination platform at the minute so i wear a number of different hats um i'm also the elixir interoperability platform co-lead and uh, that taps into some of the fair data management responsibilities i have happy to take get questions on any of that at the end even though i'm not going to talk about it specifically today um 
I thought I should start with an introduction about Emble EBI. So if you, if you if you if you don't know very much about EBI on, and Emble in general, um, EBI is is one of the world leading sources of public bio bio biomolecular data. So uh, we we sit on a very large number of, of databases and a huge amount of biological data, um, and and that's going to be the main perspective that I will be channeling today. The vision of EBI is to benefit humankind by advancing scientific discovery and impact through bioinformatics. One of the ways we do that is through the the, the number of bio, biomolecular resources that we run and the availability of data that we provide. And EBI itself is part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which is Europe's flagship laboratory for life sciences. And as Melissa mentioned, it's based just outside of Cambridge in the, in the UK. Um, EBI, as I mentioned, has a number of data resources uh, running across a full spectrum of the life sciences, all the way up from chemicals and small molecules through genes, genomes and RNA into proteins, images, cellular structure, genetic variation and literature. Um, there is a huge number of resources here. I'm not going to cover it. Biosamples actually if it has a sort of rather interesting niche in 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 this in this spectrum of resources and it generally exists to facilitate interlinking between them so whilst whilst we live over here on this slide biosamples is in this literature and knowledge management section actually a big slice of what the biosamples database does is interconnect between other data types and and help facilitate sort of knowledge discovery and data discovery through a uh, dimension orientated around the samples themselves or the biomaterials um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means as we go forward so by samples database is a by is a is what we call an elixir deposition database so we encourage uh, participants across the elixir network that's the European life sciences infrastructure network to try and register their samples at the biosamples database and you use that ability to interconnect and link between other Ember EBI resources and also outside the, the EBI as well. And so particularly our focus is to store sample descriptions. That's what we call metadata about biological samples that are used in research and development by both academia and, and industry. And we have this kind of truly international reach um, we are interconnected to other biosamples resources across uh, across the globe. So we actually have a sort of tripartite arrangement with um, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, uh, that's INSDC, and we exchange sample data on a sort of nightly basis with uh, the NCBI in the US and DDBJ in Japan uh, to form this kind of global biosamples record. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit more later as well. Uh, that's the biosamples database in a nutshell. A lot of this presentation is going to be talking about metadata. Um, and, and, and by metadata, we, this is where we sort of focus uh, the samples database here. Just to clarify, because metadata is a term that gets thrown around a lot, not everyone always uses it in the same way. We think about metadata as data about data, that's structured information that describes, explains, locates, or makes it easier to retrieve, use, or manage an information resource. So when we talk about when, and specifically when I talk about sample metadata in this presentation, I'm really talking about this description of the biomaterial. It's a lightweight document it's not sequence not like fast files it's not expression matrices anything like that it's a sort of lightweight metadata record quite often these things are sort of key value pairs or the sort of information that you might be able to capture in a spreadsheet like a sample sheet um and we 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 store this explicitly in the biosamples database this is the sort of metadata that we capture um designed to capture a description of biomaterials used in a, an experiment supporting data into interpretation and really designed to improve data reusability and and, and reproducibility um so you know it's a very easy to digest sort of layer of information that help you process the raw data that you might get from a sequence archive or somewhere else and in order to do good sample management sample metadata management we need we, we think we need two things we need to make sure that the data and, and the data itself and, and therefore the metadata that describes it is is fair and if if you're not familiar with the fair data principles i'll use this fair term a lot that's findable accessible interoperable and reusable um 
and and how that actually ties into the biosamples records I'm going to cover in one of the sections of the presentation that follows. Um, and we also need this kind of infrastructure piece. So it's not really enough just to say, okay, well, we want to make sure the, met the metadata and the data is kind of clean and well described. We actually need the infrastructure to support that ecosystem as well. Big part of making data findable is knowing where to get it from. Biosamples tries to support that a little bit. So in general, Biosamples is our metadata hub for biological materials. We have this kind of ecosystem where we work with a number of consortia, big projects, uh, scientifically focused groups shown on the left of this diagram. Um, and we interconnect those then down to the sequence archives, the expression archives, the re-expression on this slide, Pride is a proteomics resource. We have things like ENA and the European Variation Archive. So we connect down to these kind of raw data archives and repositories um, from data collaboration efforts. So essentially we take sample records from internal external sources and directly from some submitters and try to use that kind of interlinking to create this technology independent view linking assay data back to samples and the biological descriptions as well so you can ask scientifically meaningful questions and get hooked into the data resources themselves on the right hand side of this diagram so we have this kind of mission to add value and we think really about how we can add value to the data owners so if you own data where is it where is it best to publish details of the samples that you own what's the essential information that you should describe <clears throat> about about those samples and how practically do I register samples and then use that process to submit data to public repositories and if you're a data consumer if you're trying to find information you can answer ask some questions like is there metadata available is there data available where do I find it how do I search for the data that I want using some key search fields that are driven by the biological materials maybe I'm looking for samples on particular diseases or a particular sort of species of crop or a um, you know, particular phenotype so I can ask these sorts of questions and then also asking these questions like is the, where, where do I get the data from is it downloadable is it interpretable biosamples can try and help with some of these questions and we do this through a process of of looking at particular indicators of fair data so things like checking we've got an identifier for the data, making sure that you can access the information through standardized protocols or that you use a standard vocabulary or that you comply with community standards. And this bottom point is something that I'm going to drill into a bit more detail in the next few slides. Structure of this presentation and how we like to think about biosamples is in this idea of like a layer cake. So we think about the, the value that biosamples adds being layers on top of each other. Um, starting from kind of some foundational things, we've got some technology technical pillars of the underlying infrastructure. And then building on top of these things, we think about what we call verification processes. So that's things like validation, semi-automatic curation, revolving around shareable and reusable checklists for consistent metadata representation and supporting curation of the sample records on top of this, which really gives access in, in quite an intuitive way into the data. The data management sort of infrastructure sits a bit more on top of this. So this covers things like how do we make it easier for people to submit data and then interlink it and adjust the data and the descriptions that cover that data to community requirements. And finally, the ultimate goal, the thing that we really care about and facilitate in, in biosamples is this interconnectivity across data archives to facilitate this kind of multi-omics data integration. We try to give it, through biosamples, we try to give a single place, single hosting place for sample metadata that enables the community at large to link samples through to assay information and the publications that go along with them. At the, in, in the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you some examples of how we've we've done that in the COVID-19 pandemic to, 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 quite, to, to really quite positive effect. So we'll come into some use cases, but throughout this talk, I'm going to come back to this kind of layer cake idea of, of, of foundational verification processes and data management to build on these data, multi omics data integration use cases. So I'm going to start at the bottom layer, which we call verification processes, and that's this one here. So we, we, I'm going to cover these in three different sections as we go through the presentation. I want to talk a little bit now about 
what we think about validation and semi-automatic curation of samples. And that's driven by a small number of use cases. And, and here are some examples of, of the sorts of use cases that we think about for verification processes. So we really want to facilitate this kind of idea of validation. So given a checklist of samples, and there's some examples here, MixS is minimum information about any sequence. My P is minimum information about a plant phenotyping experiment. And these are kind of established community standards that, are, that we see sort of relatively common usage of. Um, and it's really valuable for us to provide at the point of submission into a data resource to be able to say, actually, you've included enough information that you satisfy these kind of minimum information checklists to validate sample records and data submissions against those criteria. So one of the features that we offer as part of this verification process is this validation component. We can also retrospectively certify that retrospective validation we call certification. So when new versions of those checklists come out or, or, or entirely new checklists come out, we can look at the full cohort of sample records that might be relevant and revalidate against those checklists. And we do that through a process of integration with Elixir BioValidator. BioValidator is actually quite a useful tool that we use to do standards validation. It uses JSON schema, and it's actually quite an interesting tool that you can embed within your own workflows if you're interested in this pre-submission validation. There's a link to the tool at the bottom. Um, there's some, some useful tooling that we have around this. And we also do these processes of semi-automated ontology annotation and ontology annotation so that I'm going to talk a bit more about in the next couple of slides. So the specific components of FAIR that we care about in the biosamples context are, are outlined on this slide. I don't want to go through it in a lot of detail, but it is worth calling out one or two of the things here. So um, to make samples findable, one of our goals is to provide a globally unique, resolvable and persistent identifier. That's one of the FAIR indicators and it's one of the things that biosamples does by giving accessions to sample records and we try to clearly define um access and security protocols so having open for biosamples records um makes the data more accessible even in cases where the data is actually not open and we make it fair so this means that we can create sample records behind um, control access resources. We have sample records for EGA data, for example. Um, and this is especially useful in, in the world where more and more of the data is coming from clinical sources. Being able to discover that there's data that, there that you might be able to gain access to is quite valuable. Um, and, and some of the interoperability components are important to call out on this slide as well. So especially about how we use the vocabularies and link across resources. So when you put all of that together, what you end up with is, is, is biosamples records, and, and, and we essentially provide this fair digital record. You can see the persistent identifier at the top of this slide. This is the sample accession, and we have these kind of SAM accession numbers that we that we have shared accessioning space across the globe. So we talked about links with INSDC briefly earlier, and, and we reuse these identifiers across EBI, NCBI, and DDBJ in a slightly different namespace. But it's kind of open file formats. So whilst you can see a sample record on the Biosamples website, you can also get the sort of views of, of those samples. And there's a number of different formats. So you can download this record as XML or JSON. Um, we use Bioschema's markup, which is an, uh, an Elixir standard, and, and Pheno packets, which is a GA for GA standard. And then you can also link through to actually the data that's derived from this sample itself. So in this case, you can see that there's an ENA link, which means that someone se sequenced this sample in the past and submitted the sequence data to ENA. So <clears throat> that's sort of making the data open. What about making it, what about curating that, that metadata and the sequence records? And what we see is that, you know, in in in, in sort of in, in the real world and across the biosamples database, there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of inconsistency. This is one of the biggest challenges to interoperability and data integration. Um, so you see this very long tail typically of of of, of how of, of how samples are described. So uh, there are some really, really commonly used attributes, organism, almost every sample has got a taxonomy description associated with it, you know, things that people tend to commonly kind of use then also 
describe the tissue or the source of the sample where it was taken from the sex of the individual if it's available whether that's a patient or or, or, or an, an animal um uh and 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 some other details like secondary accession numbers these sorts of things are really really common and you can see some of the big ones in this kind of word cloud uh the organism part the organism sex that feature highly on here and then there's a really really long tail where sort of more than 90 percent of the attributes are used in less than 0.1 percent of samples so you, you can see quite clearly there's a sort of common core and then a very long tail of very domain specific sample descriptions where our job is not to try and harmonize all of these there's no one sample description to rule them all but to support these kind of community specific sample description so when you're when samples are collected within any particular domain whether that's like human clinical or human health or whether it's plant phenotyping or marine metagenomics that those samples within those kind of scientific domains are quite consistently represented and support data integration at a large scale and and to do that i want to give you an example of how you know, you might want to try and find all of the samples from that are that are that are, that are, that are from COVID nineteen patients. Um, so you can sort of see there's a number of COVID nineteen related attributes. People describe the data in a number of different ways, whether that's severe acute respiratory syndrome or COVID nineteen or novel coronavirus pneumonia or NCOV pneumonia, so on and so on. This is the sort of text that people have described their samples using. Some common challenges. People use special characters differently or use acronyms, typos, synonyms. And one of the things that we offer in the biosamples database is metadata curation. That's both text curation and semantic annotation. So by text curation, I mean it's kind of sort of pretty basic cleanup, right? So sample source name with underscores, we try to normalize that and handle special characters. Sample source with a typo in or cell line source with a typo in, we can fix some of those things. So we have some, within biosamples, we have some automatic curation pipelines that handle some of these records and, and we layer it up. So uh, from the raw metadata, we handle these kind of empty values. We handle special characters, we normalize the attribute format, we do a little bit of manual curation, not very much, some focused manual curation in particular valuable domains, and we build curation tools based on that manual curation, do a little bit of machine learning, we'd like to do more. Um, and when you stack these things up, we, we can start to get towards quite clean sample descriptions that you can reuse across a number of different domains. We also do what we call semantic annotation which is markup with ontology terms so any deposited sample record in the biosamples database goes through this pipeline that takes the text descriptions that might have been added into a spread spreadsheet and uses ontologies to mark them up so if you don't know what an ontology is formal representation and definition of concepts essentially it gives ids to the series of terms that you might include about sample metadata there's the gene ontology efo and some advantages of using ontologies is it, uh, I'll come on to. Um, this is better about how we do the ontology annotation first. So one of the services that we use is is, is Zuma. This is a semantic service run out of EBI. It's essentially an annotation service for finding possible ontology terms. So again, we go back to our list of SARS-CoV-2 related values. These are sort of synonyms for severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. This thing has an ontology term associated with it. In, uh, in this case, the NCBI taxonomy. Um, and, and you can basically take that ontology term, label it and give all of the samples that are sort of COV2 related, this kind of ID that says, this is a coronavirus sample. Um, and mark that up and, and that makes it very easy to search and discover and then you can sort of access visualize the ontologies behind the scenes you can see that you can organize COVID-19 into the ontology tree so we can see that this is coronavirus infectious disease there are some subtypes of that disease we can do synonym detection of, of, of what we mean when we say COVID-19 and really start to try and tightly integrate that data. And we can use that to facilitate this semantic search. So that curation improves our findability, this process of link using Zuma and the ontology lookup service at the EBI means that when you have a biosamples record that looks like this, 
switching context. You know, you've got a biosample record that has been labeled with severe psoriasis with a typo. Uh, text cleanup pipelines can fix the typos. We can annotate this with the ontology term for psoriasis, which is this NCIT C3346 term. We know from the hierarchy that that's a skin disease and that's a disease. So when a user types in skin disease, you try and look in, you're looking for all samples associated with skin disease. You can discover all of the samples that are about severe psoriasis and including any other skin diseases here as well. So you can see this quite powerful sort of expansive search and findability component that the curation pipelines of the biosamples database offers helps with. So this is what we call it verification processes. Essentially, this is just another example of that kind of ontology powered search expansion. So you can see a screenshot of the biosamples database here. You can see that the users type cancer into the search bar. This expands out to leukemia. And we've discovered this sample, which is uh, from a human um, primomyelitic leukemia cell. So again, it's like an example of like how we can use the structure and the semantics and the knowledge that are captured in these biosamples records to quite offer some quite powerful search and discovery facilities. What we've seen so far is to date, we've got over 8.6 million COVID samples marked up in this way using ontology terms. We can discover the 8.6 million COVID samples because we've done the harmonization work so that we know that whenever you type in SARS-CoV-2 or any of those other examples, we can discover them all. You can see actually we've searched by the ontology term ID here um, and to pull out the to pull out the number of different samples. That's one of the most comprehensive search systems for COVID-19 data in the world. And, and we've utilized this quite effectively in the COVID-19 data portal. So through that, that biosample powers essentially this, this search um, in the COVID-19 data portal. So providing a sort of really global hook through to the full samples records, whether that's from patients, whether it's viral isolates or from somewhere else. Very quickly, I want to talk about data export as well. So I mentioned this earlier, um, but we have a number of formats for exporting sample records in kind of interoperable formats. So uh, as a data consumer, we want to try and integrate samples and data from a number of different places. We offer a few different formats for doing that. So you can download data as XML or JSON. This example is about pheno packets, which is a GA for GH standard. We mark up all of the human samples with a with a pheno packet, which gives you a description of the phenotype information that, that might be captured in that sample. So this kind of goes to the interoperability component there. And, and there's also a number of tools for sharing data standards. I don't want to go through this in too much detail, but we've got some tools about how we check data compliance. Again, I mentioned the Elixir BioValidator earlier. There's some more examples. You could have a play around with these things. <laughs> but we're essentially, we're trying to get towards this point where sample descriptions are a bit more standardized. And that leads me into the second section and the second layer in our layer cake, which is this idea of uh, a sort of shared data management infrastructure and particularly providing these services for data deposition for sort of collaborative projects. So this is a bit about saying, well, okay, we offer these verification processes. How do I tap into them? If I've got a data generation project that's collecting a bunch of samples, how do I take advantage of some of this functionality? And um, as part of the biosamples database, what we're trying to do is make it a little bit easier to submit data especially that's sample related and tailor that to community requirements. So the use cases for this kind of data management component is really thinking about out of the box sample management. So is there a sort of one-stop shop for managing information about samples? Can that be integrated in things like the way we search across EBI databases or the COVID-19 portal? Um, can that be integrated with standards that are supported quite widely by some of the bigger communities? So that's within Elixir. That's things like Bioschemas and AAI, which is the authentication service. Or within GA4GH, that's things like Pheno packets or data use ontology terms, and GA4GH passports, these sorts of things. And then particularly, can we offer this support for standardizing samples to sample relationships? So when samples are derived from other samples or child samples or the same as another sample can we, can we capture some of those relationships and to think about <clears throat> how uh how we make this work this kind of 
um, data management infrastructure, I do want to take a little step back and think about how, how it can work in a broader context. So just to step away from the specifics of biosamples for a minute and to think about how we consider the data generation lifecycle and any sort of large data collection initiative, any project in the life sciences that's going to generate a large amount of data. This is the sort of synopsis of how we in the biosamples team and the parts of the EBI think about think about this sort of life cycle. So, <clears throat> you know, we 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 sort of summarize that data generation life cycle by saying we start on the left hand side of this diagram where you're thinking about data that you're going to collect. You're starting a new project, you have to do some planning, and that's around data and metadata standards. So you might specify some standards, you might build a consensus amongst key stakeholders within within your domain. Then you move forward into this kind of collection phase. So start collecting data and in a format that everyone understands. So maybe you start recruiting the samples and start agreeing the some the standards that you're going to use when you start start to sequence. You're going to store your sequence data in fast fast queue formats or something else. For example. Um, <clears throat> you're probably going to think about some infrastructure for where you store the data. That might be project specific. It might be global. So it might be that you want to publish to a public repository early. You might maybe have a service or a database within your project that you're going to upload data to. Um, probably you've got some validation that happens around did you collect the right data and then ultimately you're going to have some process of brokering it out to a final location probably that comes when you start to publish so in general all of the initiatives all of the all of the projects that we engage with follow this kind of data generation life cycle and how that data gets shared from within projects looks a little bit like this so go with me with this for a second i've got a graph here data management effort on the left hand side to time on the bottom and what we normally see is at that first point of in time of when you set up your project, the kind of the geekiest person in a lab sets up some data management system. It's probably Excel, you know, with some files stored on disk somewhere. Um, and over time, sort of three years or more might pass where, of data generation initiatives and that Excel-based system of collecting data, which is sort of bespoke project data management, um, that does all those kind of planning, collection, storage, validation, brokering phases is kind of good enough to get you through that kind of experimental phase, data collection phase. What happens then is your paper gets published. And once the paper is published, the journal says you've got to submit your data to some sort of public repository. You've got to share your data and there's a stipulation of getting your paper out. <clears throat> and at that point, you approach a public repository. Express, ENA, pick any other that you like. And, and those public repositories all say, okay, well, you've got to comply with community standards. That's the general requirements. And they have a completely different set of rules and criteria about how your data should be collected, validated, how it's stored. And what ends up is kind of have to then at the end of this kind of three-year data generation life cycle you have to redo all of your data management you have to remap to community standards you have to reformat all the data lots of copying and pasting of spreadsheets and shoes it's all really really irritating and really painful and, and not very conducive to like good fair data management this is a general problem that we see and we think about facilitating a better data sharing process by instead of making this kind of cliff edge with a lot of pain all at the end of this data management process, making it a, little, a, a sort of slightly more gentle slope. And that involves adopting community standards at the start of the project. And the community standards that we think about most commonly in biosamples are those sample descriptors. How much metadata do I need to capture about my biological materials to make this data as usable as possible later in the process? So by adopting those standards at the start and then by use, using the existing data resources, the platform that is biosamples, this data is generated and providing early brokering upload validation of those sample descriptions, we're sort of moving some of that data management effort earlier in the process and making it less painful. 
And what that means is by the time you get to the point where you want to release all your data upon publication, it essentially becomes like a one-click process. All these samples are already there. The data can be brokered and held in private repositories and cross-linked back to the biosamples records. You just click the buttons to link everything together and release. And this is much much better data sharing process it makes everyone's life a little bit easier to think about adopting standards into the data management phase of the process earlier on so so that this is what we think about how, how we're trying to use the infrastructure and the data management layer of our layer cake to create a better data sharing process and we do this through things like adopting data standards so for example, one of the key questions is, is the metadata sufficient for, for reuse? Uh, we have things like sample checklists in ENA and in other repositories, and we can make these available early in the planning phase so that as you start your project, as you start your collection initiative, you can actually take a look at the checklist fields and check the, 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 the information that you're capturing on those samples in the field meets minimum requirements. We've had a few really notable successes with this in the Biosamples database. So things like the Tara Oceans Initiative, which is a seawater marine metagenomics initiative um, all, around, all around Europe, um, agree these standards and actually have them for instrumentation on boats that are out collecting seawater samples in, in, in the field and, and making sure that they're compliant with sample checklists that we've agreed up front. Uh, the Darwin Tree of Life project, which is a biodiversity project in the UK, also does the same sort of thing, has agreed standards, checklists deposited in Biosamples database, the researchers out in the field collect metadata about their samples that are compliant with these checklists right from the word go. And there's it really significantly reduces the sort of pain associated with curating metadata later in the day. So that's the first part. Uh, we've we, we've also done some work to make the sample submission process easy. So we've got this kind of drag and drop, one stop sample submission process designed for non programmatic submitters. We have this kind of instantaneous and what we call asynchronous submission. So if you're uploading very 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 large collections of samples, you can upload your file, go away, and you get a notification when you come back. And we can select checklists for validation during that submission. Currently, this tool supports ISATAB, which in Elixir at least is quite a commonly used uh, format for sample descriptions. We could support more um, if, if, if there's different ones. Usually, what we find is people capture their sample metadata in spreadsheets. ISATAB's a spreadsheet format. Um, and, and as you do the upload, we also have this kind of checklists like ENA again, ENA some, we reuse some of the ENA, ENA ones, there are different collections as well, uh, and we can have domain specific ones. Um, so if there was anything that was particularly interesting to the Australia Biocommons kind of wider group, you know, if there's a particular sample checklists that are relevant for collections in, in, in your domains, we can code them into the system so that as samples get uploaded they can be validated against them and we can also historically validate all of the samples that might fit that domain as well and that's the certification pipeline that i mentioned earlier so data owners get some sort of guarantee or some reassurance that their collections are sort of compliant with community standards and are as fair as possible um and, and uh, yeah, this is the same point again. So, you know, we, 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 we try to make sure that samples validate as deeply as possible for data consistency. Every biosample must have a checklist of some sort, even if it's only the minimal one. And the minimal one is essentially just that you have to have declared the organism that the sample was collected from. Um, we, we like to try and go a bit further than that. Um, and there is a registry of checklists that you can you, that you can dive into in, in, in biosamples. We have a schema store, um, and and we're we're expanding this out now. So uh, we're trying to sort of integrate some of the checklists that the different e databases that EBI use. We're sort of quite tightly associated with ENA, but um, there are there are other checklists that we we've adopted as well, and we make them available through the shared registry. 
and this all comes to to into action through our collaboration with <clears throat> some some large communities there's some like i said there's many many more that aren't included on this slide but these are some of the sort of notable ones there are some tar oceans i mentioned there are some cell cell line banking initiatives um there's some global health sharing initiatives like things like global alliance for genomics and health and uk biobanks um and, and there are there are many many other communities that we deploy this kind of sample management infrastructure to support um we could talk about some of those if, you, if you're interested finally i'll move on to the sort of last section of, of the presentation which really is this sort of icing on the top of the cake if you like which is the multi omics data integration this is the top layer of, of our layer cake and is really organized around providing interconnectivity across our kind of so positioning via samples as this single hosting place for sample metadata that links sample outside and publication information generally there's kind of one general use case for this multi omics data integration scenario and they, they have kind of specific flavors this one use case is essentially to take different data modalities from the same samples and support some sort of combinatorial analysis and downstream analysis supporting scientific insight so that includes things like trying to understand host pathogen interactions so in this scenario you might have data from human patients that's locked away in a health uh, sort of managed access resource maybe it's something like ega maybe it's a hospital database information about the the genotype or the sequence of patients and how the pathogens that infected them sort of what what happened what the what what information was available about the pathogens so you know in that kind of actually can i learn something from the the patient did the patient have a particular sort of genetic makeup that predisposed them to a particularly severe form of covid infection given a particular strain of covid so can i understand that kind of host pathogen interaction there's other sort of use cases things like can i do some sort of functional variation and analysis is there some sort of variate variation effect can i do a single cell spatial analysis which requires looking at the sequence the functional components and then maybe some images <clears throat> and from the same samples and kind of combining those things and sort of any other sort of sequence analysis in general um, where there's perhaps multiple different sequences from several different or related samples grouped together in a in in, in one study there are there are many 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 more of these um this kind of increasingly common kind of multi-omics data integration scenarios too many to list here but they in general they all hinge on this idea that we've taken multiple different data sets from the same or a related set of samples and we're trying to integrate them another example of this the one, one that sort of we've been sort of working with quite prevalently at the minute is this example of a transcriptomic study in human cell in the human cell atlas in kind of the single cell atlasing initiatives and what we're seeing there is, is people are looking for a combination of data. They want an overview of the study that was being done, including some of the maybe some of the experimental methods. The sample description is a really important where you got the samples from, the tissue locations precisely. So deep metadata about where that sample was obtained from in biosamples. You need obviously the sequence. So this is kind of the RNA sequence, single cell RNA sequence that's stored in resources like ENA. Or Express is still giving you the experimental metadata, so the functional analysis as well as expression matrices. You might also have spatial transcriptomics images in the bioimage archive. Um, and maybe the human cell atlas has, a, well, the, the human cell atlas does, maybe a project has a specific set of metadata requirements in addition and above what the minimum for all, any of those archives are. So hooking this all together through the biosamples database gives you the ability to do, sort of integrate these multiple modalities that historically have had different homes in EBI archives and combine them for novel insight. And there's some practicalities about how we do that. So you see the kind of communities on the left of this diagram here 
into interacting with biosamples. Biosamples has the connection to all the underlying archives. And here you just see on a biosamples record that we've got some external links to data sets that are in EGA or Express and ENA. So the, for this particular sample record, there's derived data that you could go, you could go look at across a number of different archives. I have touched on linking samples together through samples relationship. I haven't talked about it very much. I've mentioned it a couple of times. Here you can see sort of how that sort of practically works. So sometimes you get these kind of complicated experiment designs, and this is a patient-derived xenograft example, PDX example, where you take in a sample. Uh, this is a tumor sample. Usually, you graft it into a mouse. You, you, you take, you, you know, you, you, a, a mouse cell line potentially, and, and and grow mice from that, and clone them out. And you might have samples from several generations of mice or several different time points. The same tumor, the same mouse taken from several different time points, and this kind of longitudinal study. You know, what what did the tumor look like when it was in the human? What did it look like when it was grafted into the mouse? What happened in subsequent generations? Um, <clears throat> is quite a, quite an interesting research question that requires like this longitudinal tracking of sample information and then association between the data sets that are connected from it. There's a small number of relationships that we use in biosamples to assert these kind of relationships. So the, this tumor sample in a mouse is derived from the patient sample, for example. And uh, again, I'll relate it back to SARS-CoV-2. So when you start to put some of these things together, you can imagine a scenario where you've collected a number of SARS-CoV-2 samples uh, in the clinic. You've tried to organize the sample metadata and you've submitted it to the biosamples record. At this point, you're going to get the validation, the text curation, the ontology annotation that we talked about earlier. You can link the sample relationships together. So I can start to talk about the patient and the sample and the viral isolates that were taken from those patients and, and relate them together somehow. We've got this kind of fair sample metadata record that we exchange across the, the global INSDC network and then put the data in the COVID data portal. So if you start to break this down into what this kind of fairer SARS-CoV-2 samples look like, you've got this kind of added value. So we've got here you see the host disease marked up with the ontology term supporting this ontology expansion then the linking so this little graph here shows this idea of saying okay well i've got a viral isolate sample sample a which has data viral sequencing data in the ena database that viral isolate was taken from a patient and that patient has sequencing data or genotyping data that might be stored in the EGA database. And I can start to understand these kind of host, host pathogen interactions in this scenario. And then uh, finally, on top of that, you know that the metadata here and the data has been validated against minimum information requirements. So you can see some certificates. And if I want to pipe this data into my pipeline along with the sample metadata that goes along with it, I can export in a number of different community standard formats. So this is really then putting this all together as kind of quite fair sample descriptions that I can feed into a kind of linked multi-omics pipeline. So as a researcher, I want to find, in this example, I want to find all the immuno immunotyping data of lung samples from COVID-19 and the corresponding genome sequence of the viral isolate to try and study how the immune systems respond to viral infections. And I can do this through these kind of linked biosamples with sequence data in ENA and human immunotyping data in EGA in this instance. And there's some real examples. We included this one in our paper in the, the most recent biosamples NAR paper, which which the links on the slides for for this. And 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 then this is sort of a real world example of how this works. And you can see that again, this is the same example. So there's C viral sequencing data, patient sequencing data in EGA, and actually in this example, there's also some data in the human cell atlas about the the cell type changes in 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 in. Uh, in COVID-19. So just to, to wrap all of that up and try and reach the end, uh, final thoughts. Um, just I, I just I want, I want to sort of paint a picture here just very quickly at the end of this kind of historical, the way that the way that data flow, data workflows are organized. So we have this kind of historical perspective where if you were doing a sequence experiment in the past, you might submit everything to ENA. You'd submit to ENA, everything would be held. You'd have to go look in ENA for your 
for, for your data, information might be a little bit siloed. As a submitter and a consumer, you primarily act with you and interact with your target archive. So I, I know Ian, I, I go look for SQL data in a minute. And all the data, all the submission systems, everything else is kind of siloed out into an, into ENO. Where we're at right now is we have this kind of slightly uh, richer idea of brokering data workflow. So as a submitter and a consumer, potentially, if you want to, you can still just interact with your chosen archive. But behind the scenes, we're creating this mesh of interlinked samples. So when you submit to ENA, samples might be held in biosamples, the sequence might be held in ENA, and we can present all that information back via ENA, whilst enabling these kind of richer interactive scenarios as we go. Where we'd like to get to, and with, with collaboration of a number of different groups, projects, and people like yourselves, is to slightly more get to slightly more coordinated data workflows. So, and I've introduced bias studies on this slide as well, because it's relevant. So at this point, we start to think about this kind of like slightly gentler steps up the data management hill. So, you know, as you start a study, collect your samples, start your sequencing, you're going to start to submit to different resources that are slightly more specialized. So you submit your study descriptions to bio studies or your sample descriptions to bio samples. This is a bit more complicated. Submitters are required to do a bit more of the work of that specialist data coordination, but it gives groups, projects, submitters, more direct control over the standards that they're using to describe their information about their experiments. And it's slightly easier to submit to ENA because and, and sequence archives, data archives. Because at that point, what you're doing is uploading data files. You can almost stream them directly off your sequencer or whatever, whatever other technology you've chosen because the metadata and the descriptions for how those things are captured are already present. So standards become aligned. We can link data together much more richly in a multi-omics type of scenario. And, and interestingly, that gives us the opportunity to present that information back out via specific portals, things like the COVID-19 data portal that are optimized for scientific questions, not just where is the data, what's the what which database is it in. And that's quite an interesting future, I think. Um, Given in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this slide. This is kind of a few things that are on our roadmap. But I, what I do want to call out is that we have these kind of annual samples day events for biosamples. Though this is the roadmap that we called out last time. If you are interested in attending one of those, please reach out to me. Um, because what we do at these samples day events is try and scrape up requirements from across the wider community and think about how best to capture those and meet those requirements within the biosamples database, or if there's technology that we can improve or services that we can add to help support your needs more, more accurately. So uh, more on that there. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to finish with this kind of view of the layer cake and the link to the RNAR paper. If you've got more information, you can have a read of the paper there next time on the bottom of these slides. That is my last slide. I, I have to... Uh, so my acknowledgements, this is the biosamples team, past, present and future. We've had more people, but this is the most recent iteration of the team. Uh, Fuji and Melanie, I have to thank especially because I've reused some of their slides today. Thank the partners that we've been most actively working with recently and the funders um, that, that funded a lot of this work. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks so much, Tony. We do have time for questions. And if you do have one, please write it into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer those. If we don't have time for all the questions today, I'll collate those and send them over to Tony so he can follow up with you later. Uh, do leave your name for that if you want to take that option. Um, first up, Tony, I wonder if you could comment on the relationship between EBI biosamples and NCBI biosamples. Uh, yeah, so I think I briefly touched on this in, in, in my presentation. We we exchange, we, we we fully exchange every record. So if you submit to EBI biosamples, your sample record should show up in the NCBI biosamples database within 24 hours and vice versa. So every night we exchange every sample record. Um, so so that essentially that it really represents one global samples database um, with two mirrors, one at NCBI, one at EBI. So they should be identically equivalent. So I guess it just means pick the one that you're geographically closest to just for ease of uploading things. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly the principle of of, of INSDC. So uh, the INSDC is this collaboration between EBI and NCBI and the sequencing record. So that's it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly the idea. Excellent, thank you. The next question is: uh, Can you publish metadata to biosamples even if the associated data isn't in an EBI database? Yes, yes, you definitely can. That's the simple answer. We do have some. Uh, we do have some projects where we've done exactly that in the past. On the slides, I mentioned EBISC, which is the European Biobank for Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells, and every IPSC that EBISC is has has ever produced is like has a record in biosamples and that's almost preemptive right it's it's the idea there is that sample exists so that once people collect the or buy the samples from the biobank they may do some sequencing experiment they may do some some deeper assay on, on those cell lines and they may generate data they might want to submit those to back to EBI archives at some later point, they, they might not. But you absolutely can publish sample metadata in biosamples, even if it's never gonna be linked to EBI archives. We actually like to hear about use cases of that. We can support cross-linking out from biosamples to other, other databases. We don't do that very often at the minute, but that's just from a convenience point of view. Uh, we've we've have the kind of embedded links to EBI resources. We could add them to external resources if we wanted. But the the simple answer to the question is yes, absolutely. And if you're interested in doing that, please get in touch. Excellent, thank you. So then, related to that, there's a, there's a few different questions coming in about uh, tools for submitting to biosamples, but also for capturing metadata. I think an interesting one is. Has EBI or biosamples have ever considered offering a web accessible kind of metadata management system that people could use instead of those Excel files right at the beginning of their projects? Yeah, <laughs> yes. So this is a really it's a really interesting question here. And some of the things we have had discussions in the past about integration between the biosamples database and things like limb systems so you know laboratory information management systems which quite often have some sort of lightweight sample metadata embedded into them and some of the discussions that we've had in the past involve can we just sort of connect that so that your limb system all it has to do is track your biosamples accession and in some cases we've even talked about going all the way through to saying well why don't we just in, in issue a biosamples accession really early and then print that biosamples accession in a barcode on a test tube or a qr code or something uh, i would love to get into that sort of space i think there's some really really interesting things that we could do really early um we have a number of apis that can be used uh, APIs behind the scenes in biosamples that can be used to try and do that. We don't have really good, uh, We what we don't have is a really good kind of poster child for having done that in the past, right? Where this kind of really tight integration works. Tara Oceans is the closest that we've ever got to that, I think, where researchers in the field are using the checklist and then uploading their sample metadata immediately afterwards. I'd love to explore some of that kind of integration with uh, with with really early metadata management tools. Um, it would be a really cool thing to do. I think I'd, I'd, if if whoever asked the question, if you've got a good use case in mind, please get in touch because I think it would be a really interesting collaboration to explore. And then last question before we close, can you recommend tools that people can use to submit to either to EBI biosamples or NCBI biosamples? Uh, I, so the NCBI biosamples has got a, a, a sort of relatively nice sort of user interface. I think the for submission, uh, the respective strengths of those two, I think the NCBI user interface is a little bit stronger than EBI's. EB, our, our, our submission tools are sort of orientated around isotab and brokering from of isotab through into biosamples 
that's kind of driven a little bit by some of our engagements with Elixir. So what we see in Elixir is there's sort of a number of large data brokering centers, things like the SciLife Lab in Sweden and the uh, VID in Belgium, the, the, the sort of national centers almost that are trying to broker data into public archives in batches. Those groups are sort of setting up a little bit of lightweight brokering systems that use standard formats. They kind of like Isotab for that. So we've optimized a, a bit of the process for submitting and brokering sample records to buy samples in, in bulk around those kind of common formats. So the probably the the sort of the the easiest point of entry at the minute to the EBI buyer samples is to think about capturing samples in isotab format and using the services that we offer and the tools that we offer to submit isotab over you can do that programmatically as well so that's kind of be can be incorporated into your data your own data management life cycle but uh we can also provide a lot of support in terms of setting things like that up um through through the biosamples help desk so you can just get in touch if you're actually interested in diving into that in a little bit more detail thanks tony i'm just going to take back the screen share for me and then hopefully everybody will be able to see my screen uh, so we are going to have to leave it there today thank you so much again for joining us as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar is part of a program of training events that we offer to the community. You can find out more about what's coming up on our website or catch up on past events on our YouTube channel. Before you leave, I also would like you to fill in the feedback survey, either by using the QR code that you see on your screen or the link that will pop up in your screen when you leave Zoom. And let us know what you thought about the webinar. We really appreciate your honest feedback as it helps us plan for future events. So thanks again, Tony, for joining us. And thank you to everybody for coming along today and asking all of those fantastic questions. As we leave, I would like to acknowledge that the Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS funding via Bioplatforms Australia. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now and enjoy the rest of your day.